For those who haven't figured it out by now, that was Smokey Robinson, and his life might be the dream for many. But even he had moments of nightmares. Described yourself as a walking corpse during that time. Yeah, I got to that point. I got to that point where I was just walking around 5'11", and I'm walking around, and I weigh 120 pounds. That's only where it began for him, as he had to get creative with concealing the truth about what he was going through. Any belts or any pants or anything like that that fit me, and I have to take a pin, a safety pin, and pin my pants on this side and on this side and wear my shirts outside so you couldn't see the pins holding my pants. Of all the greatest acts of the 20th century, Smokey Robinson's talent is regarded to date as one of the most inexplicable explosions of musical artistry. To put that into perspective, Robinson was a big deal in the music industry in the years before acts like Diana Ross and Supreme saw the light of day. That's not all, he is also credited as one of the only reasons those people even had a platform to begin with. As an executive at one of the biggest record labels in the history of R&B, soul, and pop music, you would expect that Robinson would have lived a life most people would envy. Truthfully, he did, but his life was also marred by a series of soul-crushing events. Leaving the executive part of his life on one hand, Robinson worked his way up to becoming one of the most respected figures in the music industry. Starting with his vocals, this man sounds like he literally fell out of the sky. And to complement that incredible talent, Smokey Robinson was also a demigod when it came to writing musical notes. He did it for himself and landed a hit. To further prove that it was something he could do in his sleep, he also wrote songs matching the vocals of several other singers and gave them hits, including Eddie Kendricks and a host of others. Ooh, just to see her again. When Robinson wasn't working on his music, he was making executive moves, spotting some of the most incredible talents of his time. Granted, a lot of people know Barry Gordy for all of the things he was able to achieve with Motown, but Robinson's reach is so wide that the record label may not even have existed if it hadn't been for him. Gordy himself has admitted that it was Robinson who actually convinced him to start the record company, tells you that acts like Marvin Gaye and Stevie Wonder may not have found their spots in the history books without his input. Outside of lending a helping hand and giving the world these incredibly talented people, Robinson also delivered several hit records that echo through the halls of all the greatest rooms to this very day. Going on tour and traveling the world is only a dream for many, but was the life this man lived back in the mid-90s. However, there were also several periods when he almost lost himself. I'm speaking literally. Robinson suffered some losses in his life that drove him down some of the darkest paths in life. He's in every hall of fame, and his songs have stayed the longest on some of the charts, but these are the aspects of Smokey Robinson's life that didn't make the media rounds. I could have sat down and written what I wanted my life to be. I would have written exactly what it was at that point. So why am I doing this to me? Why am I, why am I getting off into all this? We live in a time when most people on the internet were probably born in the late 90s or early 2000s, Gen Zs, as we famously call them. And although most of them are more interested in the artists of recent years, people like Smokey Robinson have still somehow maintained their relevance in the industry. The only reason he's been able to do that is because of how much of a mark he's made in the industry in his prime years. But the journey up to, during, and after that time has been beyond challenging for the star. A prolific songwriter, Robinson is credited with 4,000 songs and 37 top 40 hits, including Tears of a Clown, Tracks of My Tears, and Love Machine. Robinson also served as vice president of Motown Records, writing and producing hits for groups such as The Temptations, My Girl, and Mary Wells, My Guy. Real name William Robinson Jr. He was born in Detroit to working class parents who had little money but plenty of love. His two sisters were born to the same mother but different fathers. Although his parents divorced when he was three, they remained united as parents. My mom used to say, you're going to have to take care of him after I'm gone, so you love him. I don't know how she knew that. And my dad would say, you gotta love your mom because she's a great woman. Even though they couldn't stay in the same room for five minutes together, they still promoted each other to me. By the age of four, his uncle Claude had nicknamed him Smokey Joe. If you asked me what my name was, I'd say Smokey Joe because I'm a cowboy. Even my teachers called me it. Smokey Joe stuck till the Joe became surplus, 
When he was 10, his mother passed. His older sister, Geraldine, and her husband, who had 10 children, moved into the family home and looked after him as if he was no 11, while his father lived upstairs. He was a bright, conscientious boy who planned to study dentistry until he discovered you had to dissect animals. His real dream was to become a singer, but back then, he believed people from his background didn't do that kind of thing. Nonetheless, the man followed his dreams to the teeth. Whether writing for Mary Wells, or any other one of his artists, or performing with the Miracles, singer-lyricist-arranger-producer Robinson created songs that were supremely balanced between the joy and pain of love. At once playful and passionate, Robinson's graceful lyrics even led Bob Dylan to call him America's greatest living poet. And I just think that one of the gifts I got was to be able to write songs and to rhyme words. And, My God. Uh, I love it. It's, 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 you know, it's a part of me. I've been doing it since I was... Coming of age in the doo-wop era and deeply influenced by jazz vocalist Sarah Vaughan, Robinson formed the Five Chimes with school friends in the mid-1950s. After some personnel changes, the group, as the Matadors, auditioned unsuccessfully for Jackie Wilson's manager. However, they greatly impressed Wilson's songwriter Barry Gordy, who soon became their manager and producer. Most importantly, Gordy became Robinson's mentor, harnessing his prodigious but unformed composing talents. And Robinson, assisted by the miracles, became Gordy's inspiration for the creation of Motown Records. One day he came into my office and uh, he wanted me to hear a new song. I thought it was just one of the greatest new clever songs I'd ever known. And this was... With the arrival of Claudette Rogers, the group changed its name to The Miracles and released Got a Job on End Records in 1958. Robinson and The Miracles were Gordy's first star quality group, and they continued their association with Motown as the company grew. Robinson wrote hit songs not only for his group, but for other Motown headliners as well. Throughout the 1960s, especially in the latter half of the decade, the Motown sound competed with British music, particularly the sudden appearance of extremely popular bands, led by the Beatles and Rolling Stones, for popularity among America's youth. Robinson and the Miracles were favorites among the Motown personnel, earning more than six gold records, implying 500,000 or more records sold, containing such hits as The Tracks of My Tears, You've Really Got a Hold on Me, and Ooh Baby Baby. Although Miracles struggled on stage in their first performance at the Apollo Theater that year, good fortune came their way in the form of Marv Tarplin, guitarist for the Primettes, who were led by Robinson's old friend Diana Ross. 52, you were 12. That's when you met Diana Ross? Yeah. And she lived four doors down? Four doors down the street from me. Okay, and she was a little bit younger than you. Oh. Anyway, Tarplin became an honorary member of the Miracle, while Robinson introduced Gordy to the Primettes, who soon became the Supremes. In 1959, Robinson and Claudette Rogers were married and Bad Girl, licensed to Chess Records, peaked nationally at number 93. The fiery Way Over There and the shimmering You Can Depend On Me were followed in 1960 by Shop Around, the second version of which became an enormous hit, reaching number one on the rhythm and blues charts and number two on the pop charts. When Robinson and his fellow Motown acts like the Supremes and Marvin Gaye weren't performing and pushing the world forward, they were having a blast back home in Detroit. I told them, hey, you guys start looking for somebody now because I'm not going to be involved in that because I don't have to be with the person. I don't even have to know them. But you start looking for somebody now. So they auditioned guys from all over the country. We did everything together, he recalls. We went on picnics, went to each other's houses for dinner. You could be on the road for two months and you get home and the first place you want to go is Hitsville, Motown's headquarters, because everyone who is in town is over there. Between poker games, ping pong, chess, and more, the star says there was so much fun to be had that they almost didn't know when to call it. I was married, says Robinson, whose wife at the time was Claudette Rogers, from whom he split in 1986. They would just come right down to get us, like, come home. The fond memories will be with him forever, and he is forever grateful. I feel so blessed that I have been able to live a life that I absolutely love and earn a living doing it, says Robinson. I thank God every day. Still, Robinson was on the verge of leaving the group in 1968 when his son Barry was born. He reconsidered almost immediately, however, when the miracle single, Tears of a Clown, became a number one hit, 
first in England and then in the United States. So you would sprinkle crack into your weed and smoke it that way? No, it wasn't crack. Thank oh, God it, just, it was oh, just, before crack. Just powder. Okay. Thank God it was before crack. Okay. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, it was In 1972, Robinson left the band and spent a year in retirement. He had married his bandmate Claudette and wanted to help her raise their two children, Barry and Tamla Robinson. For a time after leaving the Miracles, Robinson concentrated on his business duties as vice president of Motown Records. He soon returned to recording, however, this time as a solo artist. His solo albums are, on the whole, more thoughtful and mellow than his work with the Miracles. After a year in retirement, Robinson released his first solo album titled Smokey in 1973, his second album Pure Smokey in 1974, and A Quiet Storm in 1975. He struggled with his second album, but the third was a massive hit and produced many hit singles. In 1988, Robinson stepped down as vice president, and in 1990, he left Modown for good and signed up with SBK Records. The 1990s was a quiet time for him, but he made a comeback in the 2000s, and his latest album, Smokey and Friends, featuring Elton John, Linda Ronstadt, and James Taylor, among others, reached number 12 on the Billboard album chart, the highest rating for any of his solo albums. Coping with such enormous fame has not always been easy for Robinson. He wrote of his personal struggles in his 1989 collaboration with David Ritz, Smokey, Inside My Life. Musician writer John Young remarked that the autobiography, a story that recounts one's own life, documents everything from Robinson's family history and the early days of the miracles to his extramarital affairs and, most striking, a graphic account of two years in the depths of sea substance addiction in the mid-80s. When asked why he chose to provide such candid details about his drug addiction, Robinson responded to Jung, I wrote it because it was God's will. I was saved from drugs in 1986 when my pastor prayed for me. I never went to rehab or to a doctor. It was a miracle healing from God so that I could carry the message about the perils of drugs. At the time I was saved, I was already dead. You are now speaking to Lazarus. Still a popular entertainer, Robinson continues to perform live. He also has been busy as a public speaker, talking to groups about his personal experiences. Exploring new business opportunities, Robinson formed a food company called Smokey Robinson Foods, which includes a line of ready-to-eat meals. In 2006, Robinson was selected to be a Kennedy Center honoree for his contributions to the arts and American culture and received an honorary degree from Howard University. That year, he also put out a new album, Timeless Love, which offered Robinson's own take on several classic songs, such as Cole Porter's Night and Day and the Gershwin Brothers' Our Love is Here to Stay. A dedicated entertainer, Robinson continues to record new music and maintain a busy tour schedule. In 2009, he released the studio album Time Flies When You're Having Fun. In 2012, Robinson gave an impressive performance on the television competition Dancing with the Stars. Around the same time, the Miracles were inducted into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. More recently in 2023, the legend released his new album Gasms. At 83, now 84, the iconic Motown singer-songwriter says he's feeling creatively charged, still randomly struck by song inspirations in his day-to-day -day life, whether driving or playing golf, ideas he often records with a quick call to his own voicemail. Robinson is not just any singer, fans actually adore him, especially the oldies. One user who's seen this play out in real time wrote, the way Smokey Robinson got my grandma mesmerized right now, Lol, she 82 years old and she the only person standing up singing his songs word for word at this concert. See how wholesome that was? That's the type of affection Smokey Robinson is known to evoke in his fans. That's it for this video. Goodbye.